Okay, this project is nicknamed Grozy, and uh, that's spelled G-R-O-Z-I, and I'll explain where that nickname comes from later. Uh, this is a collaboration with many different people, uh, both at Cal IT2 at UC San Diego and also University of Kentucky, and I'll describe the different parts of that collaboration shortly. But the focus of the project is to develop a handheld device, which we call a Mosey box, and that device will help blind and visually impaired people locate uh, objects in a grocery store, for example, to prepare a shopping list and take that to a grocery store and use it to find products on the shelf. And just as a side comment, this is an interesting and different project for my group for a couple of reasons. One is because it actually involves a hardware device, which is something I rarely do. Second, the bulk of the research here, really the lead researcher on this is an undergrad. So this represents a big push forward in my group to get undergrads more involved in research. Another person working on this project is Carolina, who's here interning at Google. So a little bit about the motivations of the project. The idea here is to increase the independence of people with low vision or that are blind to perform grocery shopping in a supermarket or store. Certainly there are other solutions to this. A blind person could just uh, order groceries by phone or online and have the groceries delivered. But in some cases, the blind person might actually want to go to the grocery store and have the independence to locate the groceries themselves. And uh, so the idea here is we'd, we'd like, ideally in the scope of the project, we'd like to cover everything from the home of the user along the walking path to the store and then navigating inside the store to find the products and back. And that would include also the process of payment at the checkout counter. So the, the market, so to speak, is the 1.3 million or so legally blind people in the US. But we also think this could be useful to the much larger group of visually impaired people that could use some help locating products in what can be a visually overwhelming stimulus. When you look at a, a grocery aisle shelf, there's really a lot of things there. And if you're visually impaired, that can still be a challenging problem. Now, there are two ways of looking at the current state of the art. One is from a cold marketing perspective. Grocery store managers think of blind people as high cost customers. Okay, in other words, they're a pain. The people that have to help the blind customers should be stocking shelves and, and packing boxes and so forth. So if a blind customer comes in and needs help, that takes that worker away from, from this other task. But from another point of view, these grocery stores are underselling to the blind customers. So there is demand from blind customers to purchase these products. And if there were technology or just some kind of solution more generally to help them in this, uh, in this setting, then grocery stores could actually sell more to that market. So more broadly speaking, the type of device that we're making will have applications outside the grocery store. For example, one of the applications we want to move into is an airport terminal. But from, so from a pure computer vision standpoint, you can think of this presentation as being about a mobile device that runs computer vision algorithms and that can do object recognition. But we've chosen the specific problem setting of a grocery store as a way of getting started in this problem of, of navigating for the visually impaired. And OK, let me show a, an overview of the system. This is a slide that Carolina actually put together for us. So there are three stages of this project. There's the part that takes place at home where we see the user there in front of the computer with an online visually impaired accessible website. And the device itself, the so-called Mosey box, is depicted there on top of the CPU it's sitting there. It's connected to the computer by a USB port. And at this stage at home, the user finds the products online, uh, for example, using one of these online uh, grocery stores. 
and maybe chooses 20 or so products to put onto the shopping list. And then a couple things get uploaded to that device. Uh, the walking path to the store, and then uh, an assortment of training images of the different products, because what we'd like to do is spot those products on the shelf. So training images of all the objects on the shopping list go onto the Mosey box. Then comes the outdoor project, which is something um, our collaborators at University of Kentucky are working on, which is, consists of navigating crosswalks, um, detecting um, visual landmarks, visual waypoints, and so forth. And uh, this, uh, so the idea here is this Starbucks coffee logo. Uh, you could, in principle, have a GPS system that just indicates uh, where you're located. The problem is that this has bugs of various, it can be affected by the architecture and the vicinity, and uh, it may not be particularly accurate, or you may not have GPS available at all. But to have the feedback from visual waypoints can help you know that you're moving in the right direction. So it's an extra affirmation that you're along the correct walking path. So that part's being done by University of Kentucky. That's David Nister, Henrik Stevenius, uh, mm -hmm. Melody Carswell. The part that we're focusing on is inside the store. And broadly speaking, the problems inside the store include locating the aisle signs, so detecting the aisle signs and reading them. And then once you're inside an aisle that you think contains the products you want, spotting the products on the shelf and providing haptic or tactile feedback through the box to direct your hand to that product on the shelf. The Mosey box itself um, is shown here. The size, it's about uh, the size of a typical, uh, maybe if you took two flip cell phones and stacked them up, it's about that size. So you can hold it in your hand. It has two orthogonal servos on it with little plastic tabs. And those plastic tabs provide directional feedback. And they're inexpensive tabs that the, all the hardware in the Mosey box in quantities of one is about $300 or so. The servos themselves are the type of servos you'd find in a remote control car. And that, uh, the Mosey box itself is actually the marriage of two different projects. There was one project called the Zigzag. And that was a, a box uh, developed by John Miller at Cal IT2. And it had no camera on it, just a, a servo. And the idea there was that a so-called remote sighted guide, a sighted person would be sitting somewhere. For example, imagine a person is sitting in the bleachers at a, an athletic field. And then you have a blind or blindfolded person on the track holding this box with the servo. And then the remote sighted guide can set the servo angle to direct the person around the track. And one of the motivations for that, besides helping visually impaired people, was actually helping first responders at a disaster site where the room might be filled with smoke and they're able to get directional feedback from an external source. So the zigzag was this servo part for the haptic feedback. And then there was another project called MOVES, the mobile vision system. And the idea there was to take the Intel OpenCV library and get it working on a low power, low cost mobile platform. So we put the two together and we got Mosey. And uh, Grozy just became the nickname for the application of Mosey to the grocery store. So it doesn't actually stand for anything anymore, but that's the nickname. <laughs> So uh, the, this is under development in parallel. So I won't say too much about it, uh, except that it will very shortly have the functionality to run all the algorithms that I'm showing, because everything we're writing runs in OpenCV. But the simulation, what I'm showing are simulations that run on a regular PC. And there will be some challenges to optimize the code, because we can only get up to about 400 megahertz on this thing. So uh, that's just a quick look at the Mosey box. Now let me jump into uh, some of the different problems uh, that on, on the computer vision side of things, because this, 
the broad picture of the Grozy project, as I showed in those different panels, it encompasses the website design, the blind accessible technology for finding the groceries, the haptic feedback. Um, so there are many different issues besides the actual computer vision part. Because at its heart, the computer vision part is really uh, using object recognition, pattern recognition things, but that alone would not make a very useful product at all. So Melody Carswell at University of Kentucky is really critical in this, and so is John Miller at Cal IT2 to make sure that we have volunteers from NFB involved and lots of people in the community that are testing this with us and actually telling us what's stupid and what works well and so forth. So there's really a lot of back and forth here between the the computer vision people and then actual members of the blind community that are giving us feedback. What I'm focusing on in this talk is really the computer vision part and then maybe at the end we can talk more about these these other issues that that affect the user interface. So the first problem here, uh, well what I'm showing here is, is kind of a mix of examples of process data from real supermarkets which we just recently got permission to go into legally um, and then also experiments from a convenience store on campus. Uh, as you might know grocery stores are not thrilled about having people come in and take pictures and video because there's a lot of intellectual property in a way um, present inside that grocery store just in terms of where the products are located on the shelf and which products they're choosing to sell. Uh, we finally did find a manager of a supermarket nearby campus that's happy to help us. Uh, so now we're able to go in and take as many pictures as we want as long as we call in advance. These pictures were taken before we had that permission so we just snuck in <laughs> and, and took pictures and then ran out. <laughs> so the idea here, what's shown in the picture here is uh, a sample photograph taken looking down an aisle and there's an aisle sign. It happens to be aisle 21 in a Safeway um, supermarket and it has pasta sauce, import pasta, canned meat, rice cakes. And so one of the problem, one of the reasons, you know, I mentioned that this Mosey box has limited processing power. The reason that the processing power is important at all is because one of the biggest challenges here in making this useful is just getting the device pointed in the right direction to begin with. So we need this thing when it's set to read aisle signs to run all the time. Because if a blind person walks into the aisle and they think they're pointing in the right direction, but they're actually pointing straight down the aisle instead of up enough to contain the aisle sign, this thing, it needs to be interactive enough to, to keep them updated about what's in the, in the frame. So what we're shooting for is about six frames per second. And we have a text-to-speech module on this box that just speaks whenever it detects these different uh, words. So I'll just say a little bit about how the text detection and recognition works. We're using a technique which was originally developed at the Smith Kettlewell Institute and UCLA, UCLA by Alan Yule and Chen. Uh, this is a Chen and Yule CVPR 04 paper. And that in turn was based on a face detection approach by Viola and Jones. And so they adapted that to work with text and we adapted that to our problem. And that's based on what's called an Ataboost cascade and Har wavelets. And the way this works is you start with this huge training phase where you take a whole bunch of photographs of scenes that contain aisle signs and scenes that don't. And you take all that data and you get a human to label, to draw rectangles around the boxes that contain uh, aisle sign text. And so far this doesn't have to do with what the text is saying. It's just the process of detecting things that could be <coughs> words on aisle signs. So you get all that training data. Then you come up with features that you use that uh, really in practice are convolution kernels. And for efficiency, these convolution kernels are just Haar wavelets. It's just differences of boxes that can be computed extremely fast at different scales. And these little differences of boxes are able to describe the textural features of text. So what you do is you use this learning algorithm called Ataboost in an efficient 
implementation called a cascade. You train this thing for a couple hours and then the result is that you just put in a photograph of a scene in a grocery store that may or may not contain aisle signs and the cascade processes this in a very efficient fashion and pops out rectangles that could contain aisle sign text. And as you can see, it's, it is detecting the words on the aisle sign. Uh, it's not detecting the large number above the aisle sign that says 21 because we didn't train it for that type of text. Uh, you'll also notice in the background there's signs that say yogurt and butter and there's a wavy line passing through them. And this is kind of bizarre because uh, some of you might know about uh, visual CAPTCHAs. Have you heard of this? That's exactly what I'm so, thinking. A visual CAPTCHA is something uh, Yahoo uses these. I think Google might also. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So these are designed to be difficult for a computer to read and easy for a human to read. And they, uh, it's really a case where something is purposely made difficult to read to, to throw off algorithms to, uh, to detect it. And it seems bizarre that a grocery store would put something on the wall that's effectively a visual capture. <laughs> so we, perhaps it was there to, to throw off robots that are trying to spy on the store. We don't know <laughs> what the motivation was. But we do know that two weeks later when we came back, those sign, the wavy lines were gone. Really? We didn't say anything, but for some reason they took them away. So. These are, uh, this is an example of the aisle sign detection and we, so once we detect the text we do some adaptive thresholding and then feed it through uh, uh, optical character recognition algorithm which any of you have who have used OCR know that these algorithms are difficult enough to use on regular text much less text in an unconstrained environment. So in general, it's very difficult to take these thresholded uh, letters and simply produce the ASCII string that represents these words. But we have a big benefit here in the sense that our universe or our, our lexicon of words is highly restricted to the case of grocery store terminology. So in a way, what you can, you can think of it like we have O, low level OCR with a spell check that's highly biased toward grocery um, uh, food aisle signs. So in its raw implementation, it's not terrifically usable right now, but this thing runs uh, on the PC, it's running at about 10 frames per second. And every time it detects one of these rectangles, it binarizes it, runs it through OCR, does spell check, and then this little pre-recorded wave file just says the word. So it's actually kind of obnoxious right now, but we're working on getting a better interface so uh, you can set the Mosey box to read aisle signs and just start pointing it at things and the, and the speaker just talks and says what it's seeing. And this concept goes back to the Smith Kettlewell so-called talking sign concept, which I think is maybe 10 years old. That was based on a line of sight infrared system and uh, for street signs in San Francisco. So you could spot this sign through an infrared beacon and then you carry a box and it says the name of the street. So we're trying to do that type of thing for food aisle signs uh, just using computer vision. So this is a part of the project that's actually being done in grocery stores now with permission. But the recognition of the products themselves themselves is actually taking place in a small convenience store on campus which is called the Sunshine Store and the basic reason we're doing that is because grocery stores at this stage of the project they're just way too big. A typical grocery store has about 25,000 square feet, around 30,000 different products and we do intend to do that at some point and we have a we have collaborators at Evolution Robotics, which is in Pasadena, and they're offering to lend us a robot to use to, to help collect training data and do the testing and so forth. At this stage, we have this great opportunity to use this small convenience store for, uh, for beta testing. 
It has less than 2,000 square feet. You can think of it as a miniature grocery store. Uh, it's got about 4,000 items in stock. Uh, it has the drawback of not having a bakery or produce, but in all other respects, it represents a miniature version of this of the supermarket problem. And the nice thing is that it has regularly scheduled maintenance hours, so we can just go there a couple times per month for a couple hours at a time with students and cameras, digital video cameras and so forth, and collect all the data we want. So this is where our pilot testing is taking place. And specifically, that's where we're getting the testing data. So all the testing data is being captured with a video camera. And the target resolution for this Mosey box is a 1.3 megapixel camera. So that's better than VGA. So all the testing data is being captured like that. The training data, on the other hand, comes from the web. So the idea here is that, so take the case of this, of this convenience store. They sell 4,000 items. The manager of the convenience store gave us the inventory, a printout of the store inventory. So there's 4,000 items. He gave us the UPC or barcode uh, for all the products plus a textual description of what the product is. So all the things that could be in the store are included on that list. And the nice thing about groceries compared to, say, trying to solve the airport terminal navigation problem or general outdoor navigation problems is that there are all these different online grocery stores, and in our case, Google's frugal website was extremely useful for this purpose. We can go find the training images online. And not just one, but we can find lots of different views of these different products. And of those 4,000, we picked 120 to build up our database. And these are just sample pictures of images that we grabbed from frugal for, for different types of products. And uh, this is what we use. So one of the artifacts of this project is a, is a large database of uh, training and testing images uh, for all these groceries. And I can answer questions about that later if you'd like. But just to describe the, the nature of this, of the data collection task, we use these nicknames of in vitro and in situ to describe the, the different modalities of data. In vitro, we use to describe the clean images that we capture in the lab, or rather from the web, that typically have the products professionally photographed at a stock photo agency with a white background labeled perfectly. And then the in situ is on site. It's where the uh, actual products are located. And those, uh, this student, Michele Merler, painstakingly went through 30 minutes of video cropping all of these 120 different prod products in every fifth frame by hand. So for that entire list of products, he just clicked through every single frame, drew a perfect rectangle around each product, and even did the outline of the mask so that we knew how to separate the foreground from the background. So the testing data over here, this is the in situ side of things. The in vitro side, it's really got two parts. Ideally, what we would do is just punch the UPC code into some uh, query, just do a query into a database, punch in the UPC code, and pop out the appearance of the product. Unfortunately, that database is not available, or at least isn't available for free yet. So what we have is a sort of two-step process. You can go to Google or the UPC database lookup and punch. You can just grab any product, look at the, the UPC code, and punch that into the Google search field. And it will automatically query the UPC database and pop up a, a little textual product description. Then uh, you can write a script that grabs that textual description, does a Google image query, and then gets you things that may or may not be that product. And that what we're doing there is exploiting some redundancy that you, if you're searching, for example, for sun chips, uh, this represents seven different 
pictures of sun chips or a Neosporin box that you might get out on those queries, but you'll also get lots of other stuff in there that just happens to get returned when you type in those words. So there's a, a sort of small scale content-based image retrieval problem there just in building up the database. So you can think of it as it's a semi-automated problem of taking that inventory list from the store and doing the querying to get those images. Um, I've tried, uh, starting around six months ago, I started trying to get direct access to these databases through uh, one company that provides these images to lots of different online grocers and they're just ignoring me and it's difficult to get that. So my group just came up with our own solution to build up this database. So this is what some of the data looks like. So the in vitro or the online images, um, these are captured from Frugal and that's what the masks look like that Michele prepared by hand. And the in situ images, these are captured with the, in this case it was a VGA uh, resolution camera and they're clearly not as high quality so this is the type of challenge we have to try to find things where there's training images that look like that but testing images look like this. Um, to give some idea of the the number of different examples we have over on the training data the x-axis here is showing um, the 120 different products and the y-axis is showing how many of each one we have and the mean is somewhere, it's about 5.8. So we have close to an average of six examples per training image, or per training product. And on the testing side, where uh, each of these examples represents an appearance of that particular product in a video frame that was, uh, that had a box drawn around it by Michele. So that uh, has an average of, um, around nine examples per um, per item. So that, that allows us, for the purposes of a kind of focused computer vision study, this then decouples into these two problems where you can study object recognition performance and you can also study object localization. So just by taking these prepared training images and the extracted testing images, you can create a database. You can forget about the particular application of groceries and just treat it as testing and training data. You can produce ROC curves and look at uh, the difficulty of that problem with respect to different types of recognition algorithms. Similarly, you can study how well any given detection algorithm does at locating the object within the frame. You could start with the most basic question just asking, is the object in the frame at all? All the way down to localizing it within a couple pixels. And that's stuff that we're still in the process of studying. So uh, this is a snapshot of some of the different object detection and recognition algorithms we're looking at. We don't expect any particular algorithm to solve the whole problem we think that we'll need a combination of algorithms. Um, some of them include color histogram matching, which in this case we're just using the chrominance channels to get more, invari uh, more invariance to illumination. Um, we can also use invariant interest points, so this example is SIFT features from David Lowe. Uh, we may uh, want to use something that like the uh, HAR-like features in the Adaboost framework, which traditionally was more used for object detection, um, but perhaps we can think of this as an object detection problem just multiplied by the length of the shopping list. So uh, these, this is just a snapshot of different possible algorithms. We could also create new ones, and we're thinking of different ones, but one important thing to keep in mind is that when the user goes into the store, we're not, because we want this device to work independently, we're not expecting it to stream video over EVDO and do classification on some back-end server. We want it all to happen on that box with a quick turnaround time, so it's highly interactive and, and maximally usable by that person. And because of that, it's very important that, okay, the point there is that 
we're not expecting the person to be able to recognize any of the 30,000 items in the store. The priority is only that they be able to recognize what's on their shopping list. So in fact, this device they're carrying doesn't know what it's looking at most of the time. All we're expecting it to do is to vibrate or activate in some way when it sees an object that's on that shopping list. Now, another implication of that is that we could do a lot of processing offline on the PC when you have all the power of the PC and the internet available. So when the user prepares their particular shopping list, they might put 10 items on there, which when you're at your PC, you could optimize your object detection and recognition algorithms to work specifically for that set of objects that you've picked. Okay, this is something we haven't yet explored. What we're doing at the moment is just studying the way that these different algorithms work um, in isolation so that we know what we're dealing with. So the way that we, what I'll do here is just show a, a snapshot of the performance of some of these different algorithms that we're using the standard approach here uh, for quantifying recognition performance called a receiver operating characteristic or ROC curve. So we're plotting true positives against false positives as a function of the threshold used to <coughs> declare a match or not. And uh, in the case of color histogram matching, we have a lot of different ways of quantifying the similarity between color histograms. Um, so as I said, the, the feature matching, uh, the example of feature matching based approach we're using is SIFT, which finds interest points on, on the image and attempts to match it and look for geometrical consistency. Um, the color histogram is actually looking at histogram of two different chrominance channels, uh, the CB and CR channels in the chrominance plane. And uh, I have a little demo video here that shows uh, what it looks like in the case of trying to find a tide box. Here the video camera starts out pointing at breath mints and, uh, and cough drops and deodorant and the person scanning around and the box is looking for tide washing um, laundry detergent. So it's kind of slowed down here, but eventually the tide appears in the window. Uh, this is running at 25 frames per second and it's capable of detecting matching histograms at five different scales. And so this is just a simulation here. The, the algorithm itself is not a simulation, it's actually running. The part that's directing the user's hand to the object is still a simulation because we don't have the haptic feedback working yet. But the way that would work is once the color histogram match is above threshold, the haptic feedback uh, would get activated and then direct the user's hand to that box. Uh, that mostly solves the problem, but at the end, uh, what's happening here is the user is searching for the barcode, and then once the barcode is visible, um, you can verify that it is, in fact, the correct product. That last step, yes? If you're holding this box in your hand and it's directing it, then how can you grab the box if you've got this other thing in your hand? Oh, it directs your hand and you just oh. use the other hand? Yeah, so I think in practice the way it would work is that you, you actually keep, you, you zoom in until you're touching the actual box. But that, that is a problem that remains open. Um, I, but I, my assumption was just that you, you essentially collide the box with the, with the object mm -hmm. and then you pick it up. You might pick up the wrong thing, in which case the... I'm just saying your hand is full because you're hold, are, you, the, the Mosley box, you have to hold it in your hand. That's right, yeah. Okay. So that, that's something we still need to figure out uh, in terms of ergonomics. Um, and... This barcode thing is, is a bit, it's nice in terms of validating that it's the correct product, but one of the other collaborations we have going on is with, an, um, with a radio frequency ID tag technology from Intel. Uh, specifically, it's a VHF style RFID tag. 
and it works in close proximity, about <coughs> five to eight centimeters. And the idea is in the five to ten year uh, time range, uh, most grocery products are going to have passive RFID tags on them. And they're just close range. In order to be safe for humans, it's just a close range kind of thing. You can only read it from, from this range of a few centimeters. But eventually, that will eliminate this barcode part. You'll still need the computer vision to get you into the neighbor, to get your hand on the, the product. So we're going to use computer vision to get you into the correct aisle by reading the aisle sign and get you into the neighborhood of the correct product. But then the hope is that you can wear one of these. Right now, it's the form factor is a wristband. So you could either wear a wristband or just embed that into the Mosey box and have that take care of that final validation step. So we're doing that collaboration with, with Intel Research in Seattle right now. Um, these are some examples of the ROC curves we get for some some different actual products. On the left, we're, I'm showing a training image that we got from Frugal of Renew Contact Lens Solution. And then that's a snapshot. And next to it is a picture from the actual video. So that's just cropped out from the video. So out of that's one of the 120 objects. So there were 119 possible distractor objects. And the ROC curve was produced. Um, for that based on true positives and, um, and false positives. And in this case, you don't really have to pay attention to these different color codings. They're just different ways of comparing color histograms. But the ROC curve, in this case, for the chi-squared distance between histograms is very good. This is something that has a very distinct color histogram. It's got a bunch of white and then some blue and green and that makes it very distinct with respect to the other products. So, yeah? Here you are only comparing, you are comparing the color histograms of the cropped out objects. Yeah. But in real implementation, you have to look at every box, every scale on the image. That's absolutely right. So this, this sub-problem, this database that we created that just has the, um, the cropped out products, is artificial in the sense that it's just object versus object. Mm -hmm. In practice, you'll not only have the multi-scale, but you'll also have clutter. You could have the floor, fluorescent lights. That's something, whether we like it or not, that's going to be that's going to show up very soon. This ROC curve is just studying inter-product confusion at this point. But you're right, it's it's a uh, it's artificially separated, so we can just take off-the-shelf object recognition problem uh, re algorithms and just study their their performance. Yeah, but, but in your like in the demo that you showed earlier, it's actually looking at all the box, every rectangular pattern. That's right. And you can see sometimes it misfired uh, at the completely wrong scale. Mm -hmm. But one thing to keep in mind here, and one of the reasons we're not terribly worried about having the distractors be things besides neatly cropped other uh, product images is that there is a temporal element to this. There's temporal continuity in the recognition, which is something that's not captured in this static database. So whether it be aisle signs or the actual products, if you're looking at the correct object, then for several successive frames, it should continue to recognize it as the right thing. And as you approach it, the recognition should get better. Now, we do expect the occasional fluke uh, incorrectly recognized thing. But there will be a whole dimension of this project, which is to incorporate temporal continuity. And that's something we just haven't gotten into yet. Um, here's another good example. Um, the Tide box has become our poster child for this project, because it's such a nice <laughs> product. with It's an attractive design, good color, nice solid color histogram. Um, it's got good SIFT features, too. I'll show this again for SIFT matching. Um, so that's the training image up there. This is an example of a test image down there. The ROC curve is so good, you almost can't see it. It's way up there in the top left corner. Uh, here's an arm and hammer box. Um, and again, it has a, a relatively good uh, color histogram, so it's doing pretty well. 
some bad examples. This is real, real data, so things happen that we don't want to happen. There's a training image of a Skittles bag there. Well, in the convenience store, Skittle bags um, are at the very bottom of the shelf, and they're inside a cardboard crate, and the, the, they're poorly lit. And I was the one capturing the data here, and I just pointed it down where the Skittle bags were, and it was pretty dark. And you can hardly see anything there, but if you look, ve <laughs> if you look very close or if you do gamma correction, you actually see some Skittles writing there. Okay? And this was a legitimately cropped region that Michele outlined, and it just doesn't work. Okay? But that's real. You look in the data, that type of thing happens. You could argue it should be solved using better illumination, but that's a fact of life. We set this product project up. That's the kind of thing that's going to happen. It needs to be solved somehow. Here's a Dove. Um, I think this is an antiperspirant. So again, we have an illumination problem. And if you look closely, that product, because this is a small convenience store, um, a lot of products are actually turned to the side a little bit just to fit more stuff on the shelf. So in terms of color histograms, this has a couple problems. So much of it is white that it tends to get confused with other things. But the one distinct part, which would be the cap, was so dark that it didn't get a good enough match. Yes? So have you considered putting illumination in the Moxie box itself so that you, can, you have more control of it? We have. And uh, we, this, as a result of this first data pass, we did two things. Uh, one, we decided we wanted to put an array of of LEDs around the front of the device. And the other was to put a polarizer on the lens, because with the potato chip bags, the, the glare was, was usually the most salient features that we extracted from the potato chip bags were erroneous. They were just caused by reflection. And when we put the polarizer on it, fixed that. So these, in retrospect, that's just completely obvious. but. You tend to forget everything when you start a new project. So, uh, Here's another one. This is uh, Milano uh, cookies. Um, and in this case, it, the, this is the kind of thing that would work well with invariant feature matching approaches. But the color histogram of a, of a Pepperidge Farms uh, cookie bag is just not very distinctive at all. So this thing didn't perform well with color histograms. How does it do on cans? Uh, soda cans? The soup cans. Soda cans are even more reflective. Yeah. The soup cans, I guess, they have paper around them. But with the curvature? That's a good question. So the, the curvature is really only an issue if the, uh, if the cans are actually rotated, if the pose of the can changes with respect to the training images right. that were captured. Um, the, I, I don't have those ROC curves to show, but we do have internally the ROC curves for every product, all of those 120, so I could check afterwards to see what they were. But I think that they worked well for the soup cans. The soda cans were more difficult because they're behind glass in the refrigerated area, okay. so they had more problems with reflection. So how, how do you plan to deal with the problem of the pose of the can with respect to the training data? Because that is going to happen, right? Yeah, so there are two ways. One is through uh, when you, OK. We want to have highly heterogeneous training data. Mm -hmm. One way to get that heterogeneity is that there are many different online grocery stores who have different pictures of the products. Mm -hmm. So when we looked for Neosporin, for example, we actually found eight unique pictures of a Neosporin oh, okay. box. And they all had slightly different poses. Okay. It's actually enough to build a 3D reconstruction okay. of, of that box. Huh. Um, sometimes you don't get that, though. And I think that one excellent way of building this heterogeneous training set is to have the user community share images. So for example, you may have, so Trader Joe's might sell things that simply don't appear online. Huh. Well, you might have it in your pantry, though. So if you have it in your pantry, you can capture an image of it. You could share it with the user community. And that's as good as grabbing it from the web. In fact, it's better, probably, because it's an actual photograph with the device itself. Okay. So right now, it's, it's a bit 
more difficult, I think, than it could be because we're forcing the training data to come from this clean stock photography domain mm -hmm. and all the testing data comes from the, yeah, the noisy okay. real world. Okay. But the idea you suggest with cans is interesting because if you have domain knowledge about a type of food that right. it's cylindrical or square or crinkly plastic, right. Right. you can use that and then generate synthetic. Right. Because the way the grocery store stores stock these too, right? All the soup cans are stacked together. So in fact, that's actually a cue that you're in the soup aisle versus not in the cracker aisle. Whereas the cracker aisle is all square boxes. Yeah, that's true. And that, that brings up an issue that there's a lot more than just the aisle sign text that can tell you where you are. Um, one of the ways that came up was that some of the products that we want to find are very small, like mm -hmm. um, there was a, uh, a toothbrush. Hmm, okay. Now it's tall and skinny, but toothbrushes tend to be close to certain other products, statistically right. speaking. Yeah, yeah they're toothpaste. So the challenge might be, what is the closest large object <laughs> that's correlated with the right. thing you're looking for? Right. Download images of that onto the device, find that, and then look for the toothbrush. So these are things that are a little bit out Side the scope of the of the core computer vision problem, but these these are machine learning problems that I think the system will need in order to be successful. Um, so this is a snapshot of uh, SIFT features on the Tide box. Again, the ROC curve is so good you can't see it. Um, the Tide box for those of you that ever worked in content-based image retrieval, the Tide box is the sunset. So sunsets were the super easy example back in the content-based image retrieval days. So tide boxes, those are easy. Well, you should tell tide that then, sir. <laughs> it, it's really, it's basically the informal logo of our project. Um, here's a raisin brand box, uh, sift matching. Uh, there's quite a bit of pose variation here. And that's really the type of thing sift was built for. A raisin brand box is basically a planar object with an interesting pattern painted on it. Uh, ROC curve is very good for Raisin Brand. So in terms of end user effectiveness, if you could make the training really, really trivial for an end user to do, yeah. then, then it would actually probably work a lot better because the end user could actually train it a couple of times in the store that the user shops at. Yeah. And you know, then your training data and your usage data are going to match so closely. I think you're, you're absolutely right and the nice thing about the grocery store domain is that we would encourage all the users of this system to do exactly what you said and then there's this UPC code that makes it all so easy to index. Right. So if somebody in Lexington, Kentucky finds um, these vegetable thins, it has a unique UPC code. They can add that to the database. Of course, it's probably still a good idea to do some quality control, make sure that it's the right thing, but that we can have this clearinghouse database of in situ and in vitro training images that eventually will make the system uh, much more effective. So I think that we don't have that benefit right now because we don't have any users, but I do foresee that it will get much, the, the uh, quality will go way up when more people start using it. So that's, uh, here's some bad examples with SIFT matching. Um, so this Cheez-It bag, uh, again, it's very dark, but if you, if you stare at it a little bit, you'll see that the Cheez-It bag is not only reclined back, but it's also distorted a little bit. So the, the word cheese is bent, and in fact, the number of matching SIFT features was zero. It just didn't work at all. Um, Here's that Skittles bag again. Um, again, it looks really dark, but there actually are these letters here that say Skittles. Um, no SIFT features fired on it. Um, here's another problem. This is Pepto-Bismol. It just so happened in the testing data that the Pepto-Bismol appeared with motion blur in, in a lot of these frames. Some of the Pepto-Bismol uh, some of the frames containing Pepto-Bismol didn't have motion blur and got uh, recognized correctly. But uh, 
when motion blur like that happens, it throws off the interest point detector. Uh, this happens to be one that color histograms did work well on, by the way. But in the case of the SIFT features, it only matched maybe one or two different features on it. Yet to the human eye, these clearly look quite similar. So motion blur is a fact of life. It's the kind of thing that gets worse as you increase the frame rate of the device. And it's one of the trade-offs that we need to make. Uh, do we want a lower frame rate with uh, less risk of motion blur, or a higher frame rate and err on the side of having the device make mistakes now and then, but constantly give feedback to the user about what's being spotted. So uh, let me say a, a little bit about future directions. One thing that's not mentioned here, but actually represents the very uh, first stage of the pro project, maybe about three months of it, is something called a remote sighted guide study. I mentioned the, the remote sighted guide earlier in the context of zigzag. But what we're going to do in that same convenience store is simulate this whole experiment in a kind of Wizard of Oz style, where instead of having the computer do it, we're going to have a person sitting under the uh, checkout counter with a laptop. So they're sitting there with the laptop. The user has the Mosey box, but all it's doing is transmitting the video to the user, the remote sighted guide. That user has a control panel, which can do two things. It can set the servo angles, and it can also control the text to speech unit. So we plan to use this remote sighted guide study to learn about usability and protocols for directing people in an environment like a grocery store uh, how we already have a lot of uh, feedback that we can import from the zigzag studies about what kind of protocols people worked out for how much to turn. Do you want to turn 90 degrees or 270 degrees or what's the right way to get the person to respond to the haptic feedback. So now we have those issues plus the visual information provided by the camera. We also have text to speech, which the zigzag didn't have before. So a big part of this study will be will not use computer vision at all. It's just the process of being a fly on the wall and watching the way that a that a human operator would interact with a blind or blindfolded person in the store. And then try to use that to to guide the way we develop the automated system. So some of the things we're doing, we're uh, expanding the core object recognition ability, bringing in uh, new features with that kind of combine SIFT with color histogram type descriptors. Though I should say it's not, this is not really where, it, we're not looking to do rocket science in that regard. We believe that most of the object recognition technology that's out there is actually quite well suited to the grozy problem domain. It's just a question of putting it together in the right way and making it usable. Uh, we need to get these algorithms ported to the Mosey box. And we should, we're actually aiming to have the aisle sign reading working by mid-October. And then in the coming months, um, start getting more and more product recognition working on the device. And like Mignon was asking, we need to get these um, do actual user studies to figure out what this person is supposed to do with their hands. If they Suppose they've got a shopping cart and a cane and a mosey box, or shopping cart and a guide dog and a mosey box, and maybe something else in their hand. How much stuff, what's the right way to get their hand to that box? And so that's an interesting problem. And we, we recently submitted a proposal to NIDER, the National Institute for Disability and Rehabilitation Research. That would be a, a three-year proposal. And so we're hoping to get that funded. We'll find out in October or November. Uh, this is just a snapshot of, of the collaborators here. And that, that picture shows John Miller, who's a blind researcher at Cal IT2. And he's teaching my student, Vincent, how to use a cane to cross a street. And that's Franklin Yang from Qualcomm is watching along. And as I mentioned, that we have collaborators at uh, Kentucky that are working on the outdoor problem. And then um, some machine learning collaborators 
that are helping us with the semi-supervised learning problem at Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, and then James Coughlin and John Braben at um, Smith Kettlewell are also advisors on this project. And that's it, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>